were told a simple story. There was a knife sheath next to a victim's body, and his DNA is on the snap. End of story, right? Except that's not what the lab reports actually say. In the record, this sheath isn't a magic smoking gun. It's a cluster of DNA results. On the front strap of the sheath, not the snap, the lab found a clean non-blood profile from an unknown male. They labeled it Q1.1 and called him Male A. That's the one they put in CODIS. Everywhere else on that sheath, things get messy. The edges of the handle, the edge near the blade, the inside channel, those swabs are mixtures. Multiple people, at least one male in each, often in or near blood. And over and over the lab writes, low level results, no comparisons can be made. And it doesn't stop at the sheath. On the stair handrail inside the house, there's a major unknown male and a blood stain on the banister, male B. On two different wall swabs, there's an unknown male blood sample on the half wall, male C. Outside in the driveway, there's a glove with blood on the inside and outside, male D. None of these men are the victims. None of them are the named suspect. Most of them never make it into CODIS because the lab calls the profiles partial or not eligible. So step back for a second. In a quadruple homicide with heavy blood and chaos in a small house, what kind of DNA would you expect from the real perpetrator? Almost always blood-based DNA or a blood contact mixture, the kind we see with males B, C, and D. By contrast, male A, the clean non-blood profile on the strap, looks on its face more like background contact, someone who may or may not have handled that sheath at some point in its life. And yet, the public story sounds like this. Police say the sheath must be a part of the crime and held the murder weapon. His DNA was on the sheath. There must not be any other male blood on it. If there was blood, the killer would have wiped it. Here's the problem with the wiping story. The sheath is truly wiped after sitting in airborne blood near arterial spray under a stabbing victim. You don't get a single pristine profile and nothing else. You get streaks, you get partials, you get cleaner metal, maybe detergent artifacts. You don't get a miracle where all DNA vanishes, except one perfect touch profile from a swab on the strap. And then there's the glove. If someone planned this crime, they likely went in wearing gloves. The reports and media talk about the gloves he wore, but the glove in evidence, the one with the unknown male D's blood on the inside and out, is outside in the driveway, exactly where you would expect an exiting offender to ditch it. And it doesn't match the suspect. So we have a sheath that has not been forensically proven to have housed the murder weapon during the killings, a glove that screams offender use with another man's blood inside and out. A house marked by multiple unknown males in blood. Yet, the public story collapses all of those into one line. His DNA is on the sheath. That's not science. That's selection. The trace non-blood strap profile becomes the star. The blood-borne unknown males B, C, and D are treated like technical footnotes. And that selection wouldn't bother me as much if the chosen star Q1.1 were a robust, boring sample, but it isn't. Here's what the lab's own paperwork shows about 
the Q1.1 extract they built their story on. 11-18-2022. The initial quantitation plate for Q1.1 fails its standards. That doesn't automatically corrupt the extract, but it flags instrument setup problems at the very first step after extraction. That same day, the 3130 capillary run for Q1.1 through Q1.4 has an internal lane standard failure. The ruler used to size peaks doesn't behave. The first attempt to actually read the DNA is unusable. 11-19-22. A second analyst re-injects the entire plate. From that moment on, Q1.1's good data lives on a salvage run, not a pristine first pass. 321-23. They re-extract Q1.1 and spill the lysate. Lost about half the liquid. That screams handling risk and low quantity. It raises basic questions. Did they compare the new profile to the original? Are they truly congruent, or did low template damage shift alleles? Multiple reinjections on later capillary runs as well. Every reinjection is another chance for subtle contamination, plate mix ups, and pipetting error. And another thing that has to be documented perfectly if we're going to trust the end result. 61423. A report has to be reset because the notes packet was missing the explanation for the sample reinjection. In plain language, remedial work was done first, paperwork to explain it was written months later. And if that were the end, it would already be a fragile story. But Q1.1 isn't even finished there. Fast forward to late July and early August 2023, nine months after the murders. On 731.23, Q1.1 shows up on a differential extraction worksheet, a workflow usually used in sexual assault kits to separate male and non male fractions. On 81 through 82.23, that Q1.1 fraction is run through Plexer. They quantify the total DNA and Y DNA, then dilute it down and set it up to squeeze as much male signal as possible for trial. That's not, do we have any DNA work? That's how much male DNA can we salvage here? And can we make it look as strong and clean as possible before we put it in front of a jury? It fits with what we've heard elsewhere. The lab director saying why STR wasn't done because of conservation concerns. Ortham repeatedly confirming that why STR wasn't feasible with what was available. Q1.1 is a precious low template trace sample being reworked carefully and repeatedly. And over its fragile base, the state builds an octillion level statistic. 5.37 times 10 to the 27th power times more likely if the defendant is the source than if a random unrelated person is the source. 5.37 octillion. Technically, it's a likelihood ratio. It compares two specific hypotheses about who the DNA came from. It does not mean there's a 1 in 5.37 octillion chance he's innocent or this process was flawless. In a sample like this, trace low template re extracted still being molded nine months later, that octillion number becomes a storytelling weapon. It compresses all the fragility of the pipeline into one shiny science number. That sounds impossible to argue with, the number that sits at the end of a pipeline. All the ways trace DNA can wobble, Mixtures, dropout, reinterpretation, run failures, happening at the beginning and middle. Now drop that octillion number into trial strategy. 
The defense files its expert disclosures on time. The state misses its deadline, sees the defendant's DNA expert list, and only after that responds with more than 10 DNA trace-related experts, many of them to talk about DNA in general, what trace DNA is, how transfer can work in theory, how statistics are calculated in general, what YSTR would show, even though it wasn't run on Q1.1. On top of all that, the state adds an 11th DNA heavy hitter late in the game, positioned to do what the others don't, bridge the general lecture about transfer directly onto this sheath narrative. So you end up with a fragile, reworked, low-template sample, Q1.1, an octillion-level likelihood ratio on top of it, 10-plus experts teaching the jury how powerful DNA can be in theory. One closer, tying that theory back to the sheath, all in a case with over 51 terabytes of discovery. A house full of blood, multiple unknown males, a crime scene that simply doesn't match the story of one man, one knife, one trace on the strap. My lane isn't to pronounce guilt or innocence. My lane is to keep saying, trace DNA is different. Though template mixtures are fragile and interpretation heavy, Inferences should not be sold to juries as if they were hard facts. Right now, Q1.1 is being asked to answer two questions. Whose DNA is this? And what happened in that room? When it's barely stable enough to whisper about the first and almost silent about the second. Put together, this doesn't prove the extract is wrong but it absolutely weakens the usual chain of safeguards. Instead of one clean pass, we get a story of, we kept having trouble, kept patching, and only later fixed the paperwork. So when the lab says, we assume the extract is correct because the final runs passed our internal checks, the record shows those checks repeatedly failed or salvaged and then had to be justified after the fact with extra work being done nine months later to tease out the mail. In a case like that, the defense has no reason to share the lab's confidence in this extract as a stable, reliable representation of whatever was on that sheath. At that point, the real question isn't, do you believe the she story? It's, what are the rules? What do the lab's own protocols say about blood scenes, mixtures, and unknown males? Did they apply those rules equally to male A on the strap and to male B, C, and D in blood? Because if the lab decides to elevate a non-blood strap profile and push multiple unknown male blood profiles to the margins, that isn't just how the evidence shook out. That's a choice. And before we hang an octillion level statistic and a capital case on that choice, we're allowed to ask exactly how that story was built.